Welcome to module two in this CCNP voice, C voice exam video series. In this video, we're going to be talking about the role of a voice gateway and how it plays into your unified communications environments. When we talk about the traditional PSTN, and really to understand the role of a voice gateway, it's important to understand PSTN fundamentals. So I'm going to take a second here and sketch out to you what the PSTN typically looks like. So if I were to go ahead and say that this circle represents the public switched telephone network, the PSTN is comprised of a bunch of various central offices. And these central offices are interconnected and we call these central offices COs, they're interconnected and signaled with something we call SS7. And we don't have to worry about that too much from the end user perspective, but that's the, uh, the magic that kind of makes the PSTN happen. Now, when you have a location or business, and we'll go ahead and we'll draw a couple of them here on the screen, and we have a PBX, we'll go ahead and show our PBX, we have a connection to the central office, PBX, and this connection to the central office is carried over what we call a local loop. And typically this is, you know, an ISDN PRI, this could be a POTS line, this could be a BRI, it could be a SIP trunk, uh, you know, in modern times anyway. But, you know, we've got these local loops. Go ahead and use, uh, use ISDN or T1 as the example here. And, you know, when your call is placed from your PBX, you know, and in fact on the back of this PBX, you know, we've got our traditional handsets hanging off of the end of it. So when a call is placed from one handset to another, you know, so let's say, you know, handset A here wants to call handset B, the call is going to go through the PBX, out to the PSTN, across these various CO interconnections, and these CO trunks as they call them, and ultimately work its way to our site, to the PBX, and ring the phone that we've dialed. Now, there's a concept of interconnecting traditional PBXs, and we called those tie lines or tie trunks. And really, what it is, is it's just another circuit going into ACO. We'll draw a couple different ones here. I'll just call it a tie line. And uh, really think of this as, for example, you know, a point-to-point -point T1, where PBX at site A is connected to the PBX at site B. So they act as though they're within the same premise, or, or certainly anyway, they're reachable from premise to premise, uh, but all that signaling is going through the PSTN. Now, things are a little bit different with voice gateways, and really, you know, I'll go ahead and I'll just draw another site here that is a unified communications enabled location, and we're still going to have that CO trunk, and, and it, it still might be an ISDN PRI, however, it's going to enter our premise and terminate to a device called a voice gateway. Now the voice gateway is going to be on our LAN and we're going to have other things on our LAN such as our call manager, such as our IP phones, etc. So it's a little bit different architecture wise than what we've done traditionally, but the same kind of concepts apply, you know, relative to the PSTN. When we talk about call signaling, voice gateways are signaled or have call signaling occurring with one of a number of different protocols. The four protocols that you're going to primarily deal with are shown here on the screen. We have SCCP, which is the skinny call control protocol. We have MGCP, the media gateway control protocol. We have the standard H.323, and we have the other standard SIP. So lots of choices here. Um, it's one of those things that you'll have to kind of analyze what is my use case, and ultimately you'll make a decision of, of, in a given instance, am I using Skinny or am I using SIP or, you know, what makes sense for this implementation or this client. So these are the four common call signaling protocols that you're going to run into. And here in the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about what each of these call signaling protocols has um, in common and then, you know, not so in common with the others. So that'll kind of be the basis for understanding how you make those choices. Skinny, or SCCP, the Skinny Call Control Protocol. Skinny is a Cisco proprietary call control protocol, and it's primarily used as a protocol for signaling events between unified communication endpoints like IP phones and a, um, a PBX, you know, Cisco Unified Communications Manager or Call Manager Express, if you're a CME on a router. Um, it is a client server protocol, and really, the, one, the thing I want you to take away from Skinny, you know, at the high level here, is that because it's a client server protocol, it's not real intelligent. You know, most of the intelligence is at the head end. The device is just kind of sending messages back 
to that call manager, and call manager is, is doing the intelligent uh, decision making. Um, the, you know, without the call manager, the phone running skinny doesn't have the capability to set up and tear down calls on its own. So when I pick up the handset and I go off hook, it's going to send an event message over to call manager. When I press keys on the keypad, it's going to send messages to call manager. When it's time for my phone to ring, call manager is going to signal my phone, hey, play the wave file and, and send your ringer. So, you know, all of these different things, because it's client server, you know, really the head of the snake is the, uh, the call agent or the call processing system like call manager, call manager express. So that's Skinny, the Skinny Call Control Protocol. And, and once again, most of the time you're going to see Skinny in use for controlling telephone endpoints. However, um, you can also control things such as FXS ports, you know, the analog ports that we can connect station devices to on a voice gateway. And more about those ports and that interconnection method later. The next protocol we want to talk about is MGCP, or the Media Gateway Control Protocol. MGCP is standards-based. A lot of people seem to think that MGCP is a Cisco proprietary protocol. That's not entirely true. In fact, it's not true. Cisco was a key player, in fact, probably the key player, in the development of MGCP, but they didn't do it alone. Um, MGCP is defined currently, anyway, in, in the latest iteration of the standards in RFC 3435. Um, you know, previously you could look at like RFC 2705 and get information about MGCP as well. But MGCP, really, in a nutshell, it's the successor to the SGCP, the Simple Gateway Control Protocol. And with MGCP, the gateway devices that you're communicating with using MGCP, they're they're controlled by what we call a call agent and that would be your call manager your unified communications manager or, or your unified communications manager express your CMA MGCP is also a client server protocol so there's a lot of chatting going on between the endpoints and the call agent um, one of the major benefits for MGCP and one of the reasons that a lot of people have kind of fallen in love with it is that it offers you the opportunity for centralized gateway and what I mean by that is centralized dial plane administration. So if I'm in an enterprise and I've got you know 27, 28 gateways spread throughout my organization and I'm running MGCP, all of that dial plane logic, I mean every little last bit of it, is managed from the call manager. It's not something that I have to manage individually from gateway to gateway. Now I'm not saying that that's always the best, you know, the best thing, but it is attractive to some people. Another interesting capability, and really I don't even want to call it a capability, one characteristic or behavior, if you will, of MGCP is that it performs something we call Q.931 um, layer 3 backhaul so let's say I've got a PRI and I've connected that PRI to a voice gateway and that voice gateway is running MGCP. Well, on, let's say it was an H323 gateway, which we'll talk about in another slide, you know, that D channel, that signaling channel on that PRI would be under the control of the gateway it's terminated on, i.e. the voice gateway, the router. With MGCP, however, that Q931 signaling is tunneled all the way or backhauled all the way back to the call agent back to the call manager back to the call manager express so it's a little bit different um you know it's got some pros and cons you know we'll learn more about mgcp as we go but uh, you know it's kind of interesting to understand how that q931 pri backhaul actually works h.323 this is kind of the good old standby um, it's been around for a really, really long time. H323 is standards-based by the ITUT, and it's probably, if not the most, it's certainly one of the most widely deployed protocols for voice over IP type of applications, and, and we're talking you know, well beyond just Cisco here. H323, you know, again, it's been around a long time. It includes a couple of other protocols in the family. We've got H225 call control. We've got H225 what we call RAS, which is registration, admission, and status. We've got H245 control signaling. And uh, this is also a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. And when I talk about a peer-to-peer -peer protocol as opposed to a client server protocol, if you remember when I was talking about MGCP or Skinny, those are client server protocols. And really, the endpoint is pretty dumb. There's not a lot of intelligence in the endpoint. If you want to, um, you know, if you want to really do anything, you got to talk to the call manager. Well, with H323, that's not the case. Being that it's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, the H323 device, the gateway in this in this case, can control or, or can have control over its own dial plan, you know, all by itself. You know, you can create call routing rules within the H323 gateway that have nothing to do with the dial plan and call manager, and uh, it's kind of different in that way. 
And, uh, you know, the next protocol we're going to talk about, SIP, has a lot of similarities to H323, as you're going to see in the next slide. SIP, the session initiation protocol. SIP is also standards-based, just like H323 is. However, whereas H323 was a standard created by the ITUT, um, SIP is an IETF standard. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to just call it a standard. You know, you'll get people arguing with me about draft standard status and all this stuff. I'm, you know, it's, it's so... You know, changing so fast, I'm just not even going to go there. But SIP is a standards-based protocol. It's also widely deployed. Um, you know, SIP is everywhere. When we start talking multi-vendor stuff, especially, you know, SIP is kind of becoming the de facto or de facto go-to method of integrating system A and system B. Um, SIP uses the concept of a user agent or a SIP UA. With SIP user agents initiate sessions and we'll get into all the user agent stuff later in the video series but I just want to kind of give you a high level here one of the cool things about SIP is that the signaling communications is formatted as ASCII human readable text messages and that that goes to my next bullet here is that we have the capability to do plain text debugging I don't have to sit here you know run a debug capture tons of data throw it into a text editor and then take my highlighter out and go find the pieces of data that are important to me I can simply sit there and read it off the screen and see what's going on it's very intuitive to troubleshoot and uh, you know, that's one of the things that I certainly like um, with the SIP protocol. And SIP, just like HT23, is also a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. So you know, lots of call rounding intelligence native on the SIP gateway. And, and SIP's one of those protocols. I'm talking about it in kind of a gateway context here, but it can be used for so many more things. Um, SIP can be used as a phone signaling protocol. And in fact, when you do that, um, the phone itself has the capability or the intelligence to be able to do call setup and teardown on its own. So I'm kind of digging deeper than we need to right now, but uh, SIP is the last protocol that I really wanted to talk to you about in this introduction to the role of voice gateways. So this kind of wraps it up for this quick little video. I just wanted to talk about gateways, what they are, what they do, and you know what protocols are at play. We're going to have uh, videos coming up next, and we're going to go over some of the specific... Um, you know, hardware models of voice gateways. We'll talk about the kinds of, of modules that will go in them, and, and you'll get a whole lot more understanding about how voice gateways work. And ultimately, we'll go through some, some pretty significant configuration exercises. So for now, this is your primer on voice gateways and the role of voice gateways. And I want to thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Good studying.